Hello, everybody. Peter Maravellis here, welcoming you to a special edition of City Lights Live, the virtual reading series that follows in the footsteps of our in-store calendar during the time of the pandemic. As always, we are beaming to you from the unceded ancestral grounds of the Ramatishaloni peoples, from where we continue to celebrate the works of authors we know and love with readings, discussions, and forums moving toward the winter solstice and hopefully towards a COVID-free era. Today, we are delighted and honored to be celebrating the 40th anniversary of Seagull Books. They are an exceptional press based in India, which publishes world literature in English translation and nonfiction that traverses the fields of culture studies, philosophy, performance, art and cinema, and always with an attention to exquisite design and curatorial refinement. Uh, published Siegel authors include Man Booker Prize and Nobel Prize winners. Siegel's list is an impressive who's who of writers from around the world. It includes such writers as Theodore Adorno, Amy Césaire, Helen Siksu, Laszlo Klesner-Horkai, uh, Sajit Ray, uh, Nagugi Thiongo, uh, Mo Yan, amongst many, many others. Uh, Siegel has a backlist of over 500 titles and continues to produce quality fiction and nonfiction by major African, European, Asian, and Latin American writers. So we are deeply honored today to have with us Naveen Kishore. He is the founder and director of Siegel Foundation for the Arts, a nonprofit charitable trust which administers Siegel Books as well as PeaceWorks, Siegel School of Publishing, and the Siegel Arts and Media Resource Center. Mr. Kishore is a background in theater as an acclaimed photographer as well. He was recently awarded the uh, Ottaway Prize for Promotion of Translated Literature. He's going to be joined today by Nancy Naomi Carlson, a poet, translator, and editor based in Maryland, who has worked extensively with Seagull Books. She has translated the work of uh, Abdurrahman A. Waberi, if forgive my pronunciation, I've got a little bit of cotton mouth here, uh, much to critical acclaim. Uh, she is also the author of the poetry collection An Infusion of Violets, published by Seagull as well. Joining them are two currently published Seagull authors, um, Alain. Mabanku and Kal Torabuli. Uh, Alain Mabanku is considered one of Francophone Africa's most prolific contemporary writers. Born in what is now the Congo Brazzaville, Mr. Mabanku has won several awards for his work, including the prestigious Grand Prix de la Literature from the uh, Académie Française. Uh, twice a finalist for the Van Booker uh, International Prize. He's a professor at the University of California in Los Angeles. Uh, Seagull Books has published his poetry collection, As Long As Trees Take Root in the Earth. Uh, Kal Torabuli from Maradius is a prize-winning poet, essayist, film director, and semiologist who has authored over 25 books. His work has recently uh, received praise from the likes of people such Amy Césaire has said some amazing things about him. Uh, he, he has this wonderful quote, containing all of my humanity is what he says about his work. It's really beautiful. So Siegel uh, recently published Mr. Torabuli's Cargo Hold of Stars, Coolitude. So before I begin, I would like to let everyone know we're going to be posting links in the chat function of your Zoom dashboard with which you may purchase copies of uh, today's Siegel authors and also a link to Siegel Books' website so you can learn more about them. Of course, as always, City Lights is proud to carry a full line of Siegel Books. Uh, so we're going to be posting a link to our website as well. So to get the program started, I'd like to welcome you now uh, Paul Yamazaki of City Lights, who will serve as a co-host today. For our event. He is the store's book buyer and a member of senior management. He has been in the book trade since 1970 and has been principal buyer at City Lights Booksellers for more than 30 years and has played a significant role in the uh, national book trade, serving on numerous boards and advisory councils. So please welcome Paul Yamazaki. Well, greetings to you all. And we're so honored here to have all the folks from Siegel today, you know, it's the process of discovery, you know, is part of the privileges and of being a bookseller. And there is no richer catalog for discovery than Seagulls. And so part of what we do as booksellers is happens by accident. And so in the previous century, I was going through a Paul Grave Macmillan catalog, which is the polar opposite of the beautiful Seagull catalogs, you know, just which is one of this is one of many. Uh, but in in that catalog, I, I discovered two works by Sergei Eisenstein and a work by Antonin Arpo. 
published by Siegel, who I didn't know at that time, and it was over this process of discovery over the decades, that you know that Siegel and City Lights are on such parallel paths, like that Naveen's vision and Lawrence Ferlinghetti's vision are so similar in terms of wanting to discover and create space. And uh, I was struck, Naveen, by a, a line that you had in your correspondence with Reinhard Bjergo, and you said, a space without any kind of world driven by bondage. And I interpret that as doing a space without bondage. And if you could kind of elaborate on that a little bit and kind of talk about how you envision that kind of liberatory space, the space without bondage, and how you do that both as a, a publisher, a photographer, and a writer, and how you arrived at that vision. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. It's wonderful here to be amongst a lot of recognized friends and authors and poets. Bondage, I think I may have, uh, I mean, that was my word for a certain kind of freedom that comes from uh, a combination of genuine, sincere ignorance and experience on one hand, and a kind of impulse that says, I want to do everything, right? So, and like a lot of other publishers, I came into it completely and totally accidentally. One moment I was doing theater lighting design for a living and uh, surviving from very early in life. And as often happens in India, you don't go to theater school. You just, you go to life and you go to practice, you know, the sort of dailiness of learning on the job because all the other luxuries are not affordable. And so there was always a sense of being able to find your way through anything because the theater, you know, a, a sort of theater experience teaches you to be able to solve situations and problems. So nothing, there's no such thing as an obstacle or a boundary as we know it, right? And you can interpret boundary, bondage, freedom, in any sort of way. And so when I, when I started, the automatic thing to do was to start with theater scripts. So Siegel first started theater scripts and therefore translation because there's no such thing as one single Indian reality, right? There are many Indias. And so we decided that the link language was English, but we would do all these other languages, make it available in English. And that's how it sort of started. And then much later in life, you know, if you, this was 1982, in 2005, we did the same thing. We took this sort of translation model and we said to ourselves that our location in India has traditionally been treated by the English speaking West as, hey guys, you buy from us for your territory, your boundaries, right? So bondage of a different guy. But we can cherry pick from your list and we can, of course, sell it to the world. So by then, I think I had enough sincere arrogance to say, no, we do good looking books, we edit them well. Our money is as reasonably good as yours. So why should we not be able to do translations of literature? You know, it's a globalized world. You've taught us that we should be able to do things equals. That experiment is now 600 books old in about, you know, 15 of those years from 2005. And so what has been wonderful is that because you were again, once again, like I learned theater, I was learning publishing all over again because I was dealing with languages. I was dealing with what does it mean to be able to buy the right to do something? What does it mean to work with translators that you may meet or not meet for years? So there was again a sense of this thing that I've always fallen back on saying, as long as you have the intent, everything kind of falls in place, whether it's the economics, whether it's the actual content of what you wish to do. So there's a great sense of, I think, not being bound by man-made boundaries, right? And books do travel in that sense. And now it's become, hit us much more in these pandemic years where Again, things are being controlled in a different way. Things are shutting down. So, you know, you're having to be nimble-toed in terms of finding interesting ways of getting like City Lights itself, for example, learning to work online in a certain way, all the other 
fact that we're all shut down at one level and yet we have to get our books out there. So basically that kind of thing, Paul. So what were the steps? Because the idealism and the vision is extraordinary, but the practical steps to then make the books available to all of us in the rest of the world, you know, just that, that became a really critical yeah, that, moment for City I think what was critical, I always felt at that point was that you had to convince that community of publishers that you became responsible to, that community of authors behind those pub, the ones that were represented by these publishers. Initially, Europe, I turned to Europe because for me, Europe has always been a space of hope. And I mean the literary Europe. I mean the Europe that has given us years of literature of a certain kind, right? So initially I turned by sheer, again, by accident, which was 2005, it was 100 years of Saat. I, I, instead of writing a letter, I walked into Gallimard and I you know, met their rights department. And they were very curious who this person was. And um, I had taken a French photographer friend of mine in case there was a language issue. And I said to them that many years ago, George Brasilia had published in 68 a volume called Situations, which you will be familiar with, Paul. And it had essays of Saat, and it all said situations one, two, three, four. In. So I said, I want to publish these three full volumes of situations X, Y, and Z. And there was silence because it, they, I think there was silence not for any other reason, but because they were curious. How was I familiar with their archive to be able to point it to say? So then I had to explain that I grew up on literature. Translation used to be available in my country because somebody in America was publishing it. And then reality has changed, right? Number crunching came into it and so on and so forth. Translations appear to be disappearing from American shelves. So once that initial, then they said, how will you get it out there? Is it just for Calcutta? I said, no, no, no. The University of Chicago Press distributes for us. We're using the best translators, in this case, Chris Turner. So you're playing the rules of the game, right? As a, again, boundaryless situation. You're not sitting somewhere in Calcutta or New Delhi or getting a local person who's used to translating brochures or commercial, you know, it's, it's literature. You have to go back to people who are translating stuff. So once they did that and the first volume came up, it became floodgates. You know, everybody was really welcoming you and, We've been received with great enthusiasm and there's been huge support. And they, initially I was looking for people and publishing people I had grown up reading. So there was your Arto, and there was Adorno and so on. Later I turned instinctively and with great freedom to translators who again, I hadn't met a lot of them. And I said, what do we do? How do we move forward? So there was trust and relationship building and there was silence again because nobody asked translators for wish lists, right? You people are supposed to pitch things. I didn't know this. So I did the instinctive thing because they were the ones with their ears to the ground. They were close to authors and poets and writers. So that started it all. So it's really circles of affection, you know, which, within which you trust people. And sometimes you go wrong, of course, but that's okay. Um, you trust other publishers. It's soon publishers started sending you material, right? You trust authors. We've had wonderful people like Enzensberger suggesting do Christoph Ransmeyer and somebody else suggesting you do somebody else. Urs Wiedmer suggested we do Reinhard Jürgen. So I blindly follow, you know? So the credit is not just one individual here, right? It's a, it's a kind of, it is, as I said, a sort of uh, circle of affection. And in practical terms, once you give your author the courtesy of distribution and visibility, then sales will happen eventually. So I think Chicago has been, uh, it's been our 12 years with them. So that's been a sustained effort. Booksellers like yourselves from day one, I think, you know, have really supported it by just not knowing us, but knowing the work. And so that is important, knowing the work. Well, one of the primary reasons why we, we become familiar and excited about the work is the catalog. Just here, I have the 2019 catalog, but mm -hmm. among those of us in the trade and bibliophiles everywhere, these have become, the Siegel annual catalog has become one of the most treasured items 
both as, as kind of these objects of beauty and then as kind of a, a deep dive into the list because there's so much kind of ancillary material there, like, you know, just like, as I quoted from earlier, your, your correspondence with Yergel, you know, with, and, which is an amazing kind of like, what, 20 pages of back and forth. And, uh, but I was wondering, it was, what was the original vision and, and, and intention for the catalog and how, and well, how do you create such an object of beauty? And, it was and, yeah. again, like everything else, uh, there was, so partly there was baggage, right? In the sense that you have to remember that when I grew into publishing, I came, the technology was different. It was letterpress, there yeah. was linotype, there was blocks, there was copper and zinc and you artwork by sticking things. There was no desktop like this. Um, so it was printing and book production and design was always suspect from our part of the world, right? So every time you went to say a Frankfurt or a London book fair, there was a kind of sense of, this is what you guys produce, books come apart, your spines are not straight, that kind of stuff. And design was not a problem for me. There was always, you know, God bless, a kind of sense of aesthetics, and that is the theater. And the design and the, the theater has always been part of this publishing effort. So it was, for me, I was using the same resources like other publishers in India, but doing better looking design, spending more on paper, slightly better grammage. So quality was from day one, that was very important. And when you went to Frankfurt, the only calling card you had was your catalog, right? And that catalog was in those days, I was doing my own setting, my own designing, my own photography, till our lives changed when Shunandini, who you've met, uh, Siegel's chief editor, chief designer came into our lives as a young rookie. And then things just changed because her aesthetic, her reading, her, her ability to kind of, you know, uh, it's not just a question. We used to be told by distributors, oh, the UK needs a certain book and the USA needs a certain look. And her books work across cultures, right? So another breaking off a kind of bondage, right? a different way of looking at things. So the catalog itself, when she started to do catalogs, I was free to do other things. So I decided to send out a letter each year to authors, translators, booksellers like yourselves, artists, photographers, you know, anybody and everybody to do with our, that same circle of affection I spoke about. And should they respond in their own languages to the theme? is usually a kind of political theme or some sort of a human condition. We would then get reading material because I was always convinced that I was bored stiff personally receiving catalogs with cover and jacket text, cover and jacket. So I wanted also very secretly, and now because nobody else is listening, just the four of us maybe, so no one else is listening, put yourself on mute or whatever. These are the books. These are my books. These are the books that... I do because I will never write a book or a memoir, I suspect, because I want to do too many things. You don't have that time and space for it. So these catalogs, in a sense, are ambassadorial in that sense. You know, they, they're the first. I remember in 2013 when the good Germans gave us the Goethe Medal, it was very interesting because in the laudatory speech, somebody I had never met had only three copies of my catalogs. And for 15 minutes, she made me cry because after her 15 minutes, I was going to be going, giving a speech, but I was like totally shattered because from those catalogs, she brought the whole Siegel philosophy, you know, she just spelt it all out and, and she built in other people. It wasn't just Naveen Kishore, she spoke about Shanadri, she spoke about them. It was wonderful that that object became your calling card where friends and authors and poets wanted to be on it. So, you know, it's, it's all, it just happens, I guess. Well, thank you so much. It's, it's just a, we have such a great lineup today, and I think we should let I could talk with you for the rest of the night. And, and no, no, so, we, but we we have a whole year. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Paul. Thank Peter. you so much, Naveen. Peter. Yeah. So I, I I'd like us now to hear from Nancy, and um, if you would let's see if I can get your audio up here. So Nancy, I think you're going to need to activate your audio. There should be a little button. There you go. That's it. 
Welcome. Thank you. Um, I wanted to add that as um, a poet in, with Siegel, but also as a translator first, that I was one of those translators that um, was not sure about Siegel when I first heard about publishing with Siegel. My, my first um, author, Abdurrahman Waberi, suggested Siegel, and I thought, Siegel? And Kolkata, um, I don't know, let me, let me research. And then it turned out that some of my friends, I see Nicole Ball here, she had published with Naveen and, and, mm -hmm. and I said, are they okay? There's a good place to go. And she, oh yes, oh my goodness. And so I was convinced um, and I, I said, oh, let's do it. And then it just started a world that that I'm still so excited to be part of. Naveen was so um, personal and, and with the time difference, it's now 12.30 in the morning for him. Um, and, and I'm barely getting up at 2.30, people know I sleep in. <laughs> uh, but we'd start chatting a little bit. And then I said, well, I'm working on translating a novel, a co-translating <laughs> novel by Suzanne Drachus from Martinique. And he said, oh, um, I want to publish it. And I'm like, you don't even know me. You haven't seen my my Waberi translations, really. But he does his research and he knows about people and knows about authors. And um, he he went on to publish the novel. And then uh, I started bringing ideas to him. And um, when I when I uh, I, I think uh, some people would give me ideas. Uh, Tess Lewis is here, and she suggested that I translate Alain Mavoncou. And uh, uh, for me, I looked at an anthology, and that's where I found Cal. And um, that's also where I found Abdu. So Naveen has always been open to hearing what I have to say. And there have been some people I've proposed, and he's kind of looked, and he said, well, you know. But then there are others where recently I just sent one poem by an author, one poem. And he said to me, I really love this. I, I really want to see more of this work. So I, I appreciate his honesty. I appreciate his openness. I appreciate that when um, I approach him about a translation in Spanish, he, he, um, he looked at one or two poems and, and he was like, yes, this, she is a wonderful, Poetess. And so that's a, a project that I'm co translating with Esperanza Hope Snyder, who's here in the audience, too. So I can't say enough about how glad I am to be part of the Seagull family as a, a translator and as a poet. So, Nancy, I'm hoping that uh, we will get to hear a little of your work as well as the work of, of some of the people that you've translated and then also maybe create a segue into our, our, our poets tonight. So um, I guess um, I have a new manuscript that, that Naveen is going to publish and it's called Playing Piano in the Dark. And I'll read, I'll read one poem here, a villain one. And um, I think we have a love hate relationship with our bodies at least I do, and we need them. Um, can't live with them, can't live without them, but they do not nice things as well. And um, I tend to obsess about things too, and body things. And um, having having been through the cancer experience, you never know, and, and you never know if one little cell has broken off and it took a, a ride in the blood and is just waiting there. So that's what, um, prompted this poem called Translating the Body. Our organs sing in different keys, like sirens in a sea of blood. The body feels before it knows. Easier to read disease in leaves drooping from unseen root rot or mold. The body feels. Before it knows rain's coming, it's sensed in the bones or in vessels flooding the head. Our organs sing in different keys, 
major for liver and lungs, minor for tonsils and thymus gland. The body feels before it knows the language of dormant cells awakening, spreading like jimson weed. Our organs sing in different keys, shipwrecked in growing storms, defiant and desperate for places to hide. Our organs sing in different keys the body feels before it knows. So segueing into our poets, our wonderful author poets who have joined us from all parts of the world. Um, we're going to start, uh, well, well, similar because Alain, you're in Paris now too, I think. Wait, you're muted. Yes. Uh, yes, uh, yeah. No, I'm in Los Angeles, as you can see over there. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, I got confused. Okay. And, and Paul is in Lyon. So Paul, okay. I'll yeah. start reading from a few poems from Cargo Hold of Stars and Sunandini, the uh, wonderful graphic artist and editor at Siegel, designs all the book covers. This beautiful picture of a, of a coolie, I put in quotes. Carl has revisioned, reimagined that term, but it's a coolie woman who on the cover, and she just does gorgeous work, and the books feel so good. And Carl, before we start, can you tell us something about um, what brought you to writing this book and um, the background of what, what brought you to it, please? Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Well, this book, um, I started writing it in 1989. Um, during the bicentenary of the French Revolution commemorations in France, which was a very big event. And this coincided, coincided with the fall of the wall of Berlin. You know, it's I think a major paradigmatic shift in world history. And just as the French Revolution celebrated by the French before, because it started a kind of new political order for the bourgeois and, um, and maybe for the lower classes of French society. And um, I was wondering, you know, I was a student in Lyon at that time what could I celebrate in my own history? And uh, as a Mauritian kid, because I was born in Mauritius, you know, this very small island uh, in the, the, uh, at the east of Madagascar, which was a French, uh, discovered by the Arabs, then came the Portuguese, the Dutch, then the British and the French. And uh, this, uh, my history was a bit muted for me, you know, and I was asking myself the question, what can I say about my own history in the 1989 year, which is so dense and so important. And of course, that in, uh, in the 70s, 60s, we were taught British history, not our own history. And as a very interesting uh, element. Mauritius was the, the crossroad of what the British called the Great Experiment or the Coolie Trade. And I was looking for information about that period of history because my father, my father's great grandparents uh, came from India and they went to Trinidad and Tobago as indentured persons, you know, the, the coolie or indentured person are synonymous. And I could not find anything. Then I say, well, maybe I'll have to, to write something foundational and, uh, and mute the archives because I, I wanted to give voice, you know, uh, to those downtrodden uh, people who experimented transnationally, globally, uh, 
contracted labor uh, across the world because from India, China, sometimes from Africa, Madagascar, they replaced these slaves in 1834 because that was a major date. The British Empire abolished the slavery, but there was no, no song, no celebration of their memory. And I wanted to challenge the silence of the archives and voicelessness. But when I wrote this uh, poetological book, it's because I was engaging with memory, with uh, semiology, with linguistics, with history, with anthropology, all in this book. I wanted to make a, an inclusive book. That is, I did not want to enter in a memorial competition, for example, with other bonded or semi-bonded people like the slaves, for example. And I said, these uh, who were there before in bondage, uh, Navin used this term, you know, this continues. <laughs> um, I, I said, it is wise to connect these histories. Then I thought of a, of a word said by uh, the French Minister of Culture, André Malraux. He said, um, what uh, would I learn about my suffering if I don't open it on the suffering of the others. And that is the basis of, of, of Coolitude, which is writing a piece of history and connecting it with other pieces of fragments of the Cooley history across the globe, because it is a transnational, it is a global uh, history. That was the, the origin of, of my writing and invention of the word coolitude, which then became a, a methodology to articulate slavery um, and indenture, and also to develop what we call inclusive indenture, which can address burning issues like Anthropocene, uh, transculturalism, and so on and so forth. Thank you. That's fascinating to hear it in your own words. We can read it, uh, but to hear you say it. We have time for a few poems, so folks will hear that. I think what we'll do is, the, in the interest of time, we'll skip the first one and we'll go to the second one to give the audience a flavor of, of what your work is like, which is a real pain to translate. Sorry about that. <laughs> you make up words, you have rhymes, you have multiple meanings for every word, and to make that happen in English is quite a challenge to, to do and stick to the original meaning, but this one gives the audience a sense of what's involved in the sounds, and I'll read it in English, and Carl, if you would please read in the French. There are no titles. Language has coolied me for conception, word of my spit, pure cascade, mixed cascade, casket bound. Pure water pays no attention to bloodlines, cast, clasped, cloned. Guessing at what my next roots will be is my true harvest of maritime dreams. Le langage m'a coulé pour conception. Mot de ma salive, coulé pur, coulé sale, coup lié. L'eau pure ignore les sangs, coulé, calé, calqué. Devinez mes prochains itinéraires et ma vraie moisson you can hear those sounds in French. And the book's divided in three parts before the voyage, the big voyage that then goes in the middle part of, of those horrible transoceanic voyages where the, the indentured workers were thrown into the cargo hold, but they looked up and they could see the stars. 
And then the other section is about what life was like pretty awful once they reached the colonies, once they were working in the fields, the terrible conditions, the terrible terms, the extension of labor terms to contracts. And the East India Trading Company was not a nice group of people either. So this one is about that. Do you know the tale of the lonesome man in the East India Trading Company? His skin was lit with sparks, salt pond pours on a rainy night. To the pearls of spume, his voice became an almanac for seasons of exile. Often this man returned to the seas on the dallow of his wound. Sometimes along streets of lost waves, he blows out stars on his china divans. Often long blue rattan brands his flesh with algae from the horizon's only shipwreck. To ignite the dawn of crystal cries, this loner sells iron stoves in the paved courtyard of lagoons. Connais-tu l'histoire de l'homme trop seul en la compagnie des Indes? Sa peau était étincelle, port des salines un soir de pluie. Au père des écumes, sa voix devint almanach des saisons d'exil. Cet homme souvent retourne aux vagues sur le dallo de sa blessure. Parfois, aux rues des vagues perdues, il souffle les étoiles sur ses divans en porcelaine. Souvent, de longs rotins bleus marquent sa chair d'algue du seul naufrage de l'horizon. Pour embraser l'aurore au cri de cristal, ce solitaire vend des réchauds de fer dans la cour pavée des lagons. And the next to the last poem for my grandparents. If only my mother had told me about the sea, even on a, moon sun, a monsoon evening, when on the roof the kelp was sighing under the wind's scythe. But the poor woman felt the earth down to her blood and to make the night fall in our eyes, she would rise to reach fig, lemon, mint, her sweet potion. If only the earth could tell me the words of the sea. Yet one night she spoke of a great coral monster birthed by dreadful waves of a depth more abyssal than our murky hallway. She told me you lose your temper at waves. She told me you get impaled on coral. She told me you run yourself aground on algae. And yet on the roof, if she's to be believed, a boat capsizes with each gust of wind. And yet, as she tells it, when she's seen, seamen remember her strange screams. À mes grands-parents, si seulement ma mère m'avait parlé de la mer, même un soir de mousson, quand sur le toit le goémo se plaignait à la faux du vent. Mais la pauvre femme sentait la terre jusqu'à son sang, et pour faire descendre la nuit sur nos yeux, elle se levait pour toucher la figue, le citron, la menthe, sa douce potion. Si seulement la terre pouvait me dire parole de mer. Pourtant, elle me parla un soir d'un grand monstre au corail accouché de vilaines vagues, d'une profondeur plus abyssale que notre sombre couloir. Aux vagues, elle me dit, tu t'emportes. Au corail, Elle me dit, tu t'empales. Aux algues, elle me dit, tu t'affales. Et pourtant, sur le toit, à l'en croire, 
Un bateau se renverse à chaque rafale. Et pourtant, dans sa voix, à la voir, les matelots ont d'étranges cris pour mémoire. And for our last poem, Kal is going to just read the English. My skin sings more than I do. That's why I was born in a country whose name is inscribed in the sea. My skin speaks more quickly than my voice. It truly weighs me down. That's why my cries are the backwash of men captured by silk, exiled by nutmeg, and rooted by sugar, by islands and colonies. My skin is caulking for my flesh and all the memories carried by pitching mast. My song is therefore coolie. My coolitude is my only share of a memory tossed by the waves. In the wakes of boats, sowing men at the end of the world, I want to speak of my task as a man and my flesh of ink, for my words were watching as open-hulled ships sailed by. Do I read in French? No, I think we have time constraints. Thank okay. you. That was beautiful to hear these words in English in your voice. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you, Sid Lights and Peter and Paul for hosting this reading and celebration for Seagull. So, switching gears. Yeah. Can we have Alain um, read um, something from, from his work? Yeah, if we could, yes. that would be great. Oh. So we're switching gears here to Alain. Um, and Alain, can you give us a few words about what got you to write the two books that this book, As Long As Trees Take Root in the Earth, have in them and they are separated by other books so we chose these two to put together okay first of all i want to thank everyone for this opportunity mainly nancy the job you are doing for translating francophone writers like me that the first time i'm being translated into english Although I've been writing poetry for like uh, 20 or 25 years, I'm now 55. And uh, to see that you are devoting, you are like uh, committed to publish like uh, Waberi or my great friend Carl, who is one of, uh, for me, one of the greatest poets coming from the island it's make me feel like uh, poetry is still powerful. So to go back to my book, as long as trees take root in the earth, I think that uh, when I began to write poetry, I wasn't that sure that uh, I would be publishing poetry in my life. I was just expressing the fact that uh, I was in Europe alone because I'm the only kid of my father and my mother. I was like far from my country. So the only way to talk to the people from the Congo was to write uh, a kind of long letter to them to express how the distance won't kill this kind of relation we have and we're gonna keep on having. So you did select a lot of poem among the all I wrote. I think that you did a good job because you uh, like catch, you caught the head of snake. Uh, you, you find what can uh, like uh, summarize my poetry. 
I talk about uh, my motherland. I talk about my mother. I talk about uh, the loss of my past. But at the same time, I, it's a kind of nostalgic poem without being someone who is lament, lamenting or crying day in and day out. That's why after writing like uh, almost, I think five or six books of poetry, I was like uh, feeling that I didn't have something else to write about poetry. Then I be began, I began to write novels. People didn't read uh, my poetry back then. It just when I become more known thanks to the novels, and then people went back to discover my poetry. And uh, now I'm directing like, uh, um, I'm a director, I'm publishing poets now in, in France in the collection called uh, Point at the Edition du Seuil. And uh, I can say that uh, poetry remains my main voice. And I'm trying to come back to it. And your translation uh, did a good thing to shake me up and to let me know that I have to keep on writing poetry. At the end of the day, I think, even if I'm writing novels more and more now, but a novel is efficient if only it's carried by a kind of uh, poetry, epic poetry, the novels we like, like uh, Hundred Years of Solitude, uh, like The Old Man and the Sea are carried by poetry. So even writing novels now, I won't forget that I am still a poet and I'm just a poem, a poet lost in the world of the novel. That's, why I, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. I'm glad that you are remaining a poet in your heart and there'll be more poems. And, and, and I want to add also by thanking you, I'm thanking Naveen because he took the challenge to publish for the first time my book and it's well done. It's done with heart, hardcover. It's like a, a piece of art, the way they're working with uh, Sigurd over there. Absolutely. If I just say, just say a word, yeah. because when I met Alain some of, maybe 30 years ago or more, yeah. in Paris, <laughs> we were both writing poetry. This is how yeah. we got to know each other, <laughs> you know? And uh, what you said, uh, just a few words, mm -hmm. about the, the power of poetry in novel writing. Mm -hmm. I believe that there is a kind of energy and the, the power of the image that poetry conveys that is that brings something out in the novel that is, for me, exceptional. And, you know, of course, I think the, the, the good uh, novel writers, as you are, I know when I read your prose, mm. I can see how you sculpt your words, mm. how you cut your, 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 your sentences, your rhythm, the rhythm of your images, of your thoughts. It is, for me, very poetical. This is what I wanted to say. And I'm very glad I was telling Paul before that uh, maybe last time we met at the Fair Book of Paris, it was 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, I am so glad to, to be with you here for the 40 years. Thank you, Naveen, for bringing us together uh, for the 40 years of Seagull. Uh, and uh, I would also just like to say a word. Thank you very much, Nancy, for your I know, uh, very hard work <laughs> because <laughs> it is not easy to translate poetry. But one thing is sure, and thank you, Naveen, for this. A philosopher said that poetry is a language of the world. And what you are doing is enabling, enabling us to speak the language of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. So let's hear some 
of Alain's poetry. And Alain, let's go with the first five in French English, and then you'll read the last ones in English. Okay. So Alain's words are easier to translate, but their <laughs> meaning is very, very deep and strange. No titles, no punctuation. It's midnight. Shrews and pangolins already roam the banks of the Lukula. Death is moaning in dens, thickets of silence suddenly stir. My torch has gone out. I'm haunted by words. I can't wait to complete this tale before the break of day. Il est minuit. Les musaraignes et les pangolins errent déjà sur les rives de la Lukula. La mort gêne dans les antres des buissons de silence s'agite soudain. Ma torche s'est éteinte, les mots me hantent. Il me tarde maintenant d'achever ce récit avant la pointe du jour. Now the eyes shut halfway. Dreams are diverted as soon as you drift off towards the shores of that childhood you lug around like a shell scrubbed clean by marine salts. Ici, l'œil se ferme à moitié. Le rêve est détourné au moindre assoupissement vers les rivages de cette enfance que l'on porte telle une carapace lessivée par les sels marins. Borders go astray. I remember streams, manganese, my own forest. Congo River, backbone of the homeland. Les frontières s'égarent. Je me rappelle les cours d'eau, le manganèse, la forêt du Mayombe, le fleuve Congo, colonne vertébrale de la patrie. You think you are writing for relief. And you realize that words incubate scars of unfulfilled moments. The shadow precedes the hand. The extinguished light finds the murmur again of death vigil nights. On pense écrire pour l'apaisement et l'on réalise que les mots couvrent les stigmates des instants inaboutis. L'ombre précède la main. Le feu éteint retrouve le murmure des nuits de veillée mortuaire. Long is the distance. That's the only way people can value the path. Don't forget, without birds, without trees, without rivers, no forest exists. Long est la distance. Ce n'est qu'ainsi que l'homme apprécie le chemin. Ne pas oublier, sans oiseaux, sans arbres, sans rivière, il n'y a pas de forêt. And now, in English, on starting at page 55, six short poems dedicated to Alain's mother. Mother, now I hear the oracle murmur your final words. This is my last testament. This is my last will and testament written in the shade of silence, not far from the middle of death at the hour when the weary camel quickens its pace to read the oasis. This is my last will and testament Dying wishes rested from the night to read when the common cranes take wing before the roster proclaims the dawn of another day. My dying wishes, words to translate for the deaf, not for the deaf who hear the voices of silence, but for the deaf who don't want to hear. This is my last will 
and testament, I, Genge, daughter of Mokila, born in Lubulu, distant ochre lands, yellow and burnt savannas, hill folds, slash and burn lands of tubers and antelopes. This is my last will and testament. Not knowing how to read or write, I sign this with an X and speak in my own voice through the trance I breath into the scribe that you see here. And there's one more. Oh, I've forgotten one. Yeah, <laughs> on 60, the last one, the best one. No, 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 yeah. This is my last word. Yes, this is my last will and testament. I don't know from where this conflict comes, but beware of the sky in retreat. None of you will be able to read the whispering of ancestors on the faces of masks. If in each corner of a heart, I catch sight of the glare of a gun. Thank you. Thank you. Merci. Well, this has been such a pleasure and it is such an honor to have you all here. And I know the time difference is very daunting for most of you. So <laughs> we really, really appreciate that, that you know, you would join us today. And Nancy, thank you so much. Elaine Mbanku, Kyle Torabuli, thank you both for reading your work so beautifully. Uh, it's just, it's so moving. And, and Naveen, um, if I could have you just for a moment, tell us, you know, what's coming up? What do we have to look forward to? from Siegel? Uh, gosh, there's, there's a lot of books, of course, but we're also, you know, we're not doing some kind of a chest thumping celebration for Siegel at 40. It's going to be this kind of a thing. And also uh, the times being what they are, what we thought we would do is we're, there will be a quiet imprint that says Siegel at 40. Mm -hmm. And there will be many books with that imprint. And that's how you will recognize that there is some affirmation of the word being celebrated. Um, we have, so there would be, of course, our own sort of um, circle of authors. So there's, for example, there's Agamben on Pinocchio and there's Sixu on Ruins at one level. And there's a very interesting, and this is, nobody else knows it. This is the first time it's been talked about, which is a uh, very strange, almost memoir by Michael Ondaatje, which is going to be original to us, which has a strange, uh, you know, the way it came about. And so there's, there's uh, we're hoping also to have people like China Mayville and, you know, people who are not quote unquote are recognized authors, but they are, they, I think there's, there's a kind of affection for what we do as there is our respect for what they do. So I just reached out to a lot of people. There's Alexander Kluger and there's, you know, uh, George Bazlitt. So there's, the, you know, there's Carlo Gitzberg. So it's a kind of, uh, it's, it's what we do. We do a little more of that and we widen that. But what might be interesting for you also is that in spring, we start to turn initially our French and German books into audio books. So, you know, there, there, there would be about a dozen starting in spring and another dozen in fall. And this we carry on all the way from this spring to the fall of 23. And we hope to have a lot of these events and so on and so forth. Um, that's the only way I know to resist the times. <laughs> well, it is wonderful to see Seagull as vital as ever. And we look forward to all of these wonderful, Thank you. wonderful Thank projects. You, Peter. Thank you, Paul. It is so, 
such an honor to have you here. And thanks to everyone in the audience for joining us today. I have posted links in the chat function with which you can visit the Siegel site and of course, purchase books from all of our participants today. Uh, this event is being made possible by the City Lights Foundation, continuing the vision of Lawrence Ferlinghetti into the future. Um, everyone, please be safe, be well. We hope to see you all again soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you a lot, uh, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.